Okay. Um, I'm trying to record this with Photo Booth because my iMovie is busy exporting my longer video that I just recorded. Um, so this is going to be a little weird. This might get a little weird because I've noticed that in the past when I tried to record videos with Photo Booth, um, audio was wildly out of sync with the video. So if that's the case this time, I'll re-record the video. But um, I wanted to briefly talk about um, unions. Uh, the thing about unions that I want to emphasize is that what unions do, or rather, you know, the group that the unions are in conflict with, in in uh, existential conflict with, are not the employers. It's actually other labor, non-unionized non-unionized labor. Let me explain. Um, what unions want to do is raise wages, which is a price for their labor services. How do you raise a price in the market? How do you induce the buyer to pay you a higher price, or the buyers to pay you a higher price? Well, the way to do it is to restrict supply. If there's a lot of sellers in the market offering a product, uh, the more sellers there are relative to the number of buyers, the lower the price is going to tend to be all other things being equal. It's a, it's the normal functioning of the law of demand. Conversely, if you get a, a lower number of sellers, fewer sellers, relative to the number of buyers, then those buyers are going to start uh, chasing the good that is being sold and bidding the price up, depending on how much they want that good. So what the unions are doing is that they restrict the supply of labor services available to the employer. The unions are not this benign uh, way of organizing or, or organizing themselves for the workers where workers get together and decide to bargain collectively. And the union legislation that exists today in the U.S. and in other parts of the world um, although I'm more knowledgeable about the union legislation in the United States um, than even you know my home country of Russia or any other country for that matter, but it is what it is. Um, what the union legislation does is not provide a framework for people to bargain collectively. In fact, you don't need uh, a special law to allow you to bargain collectively. You can just bargain collectively. You just you know, voluntarily get together and decide, okay, we want to bargain as a group. We want to come to the employer and say, look, uh, buddy, we're working for you here and you're paying us wages. Well, we, we talked amongst ourselves. We decided that, that all of us together are going to demand that you raise our salaries. Okay, it's out now. We're going to demand that you raise our salaries. We want to be paid more for the same amount of work. Okay? And if you don't, we are not going to work. Well, in a free market situation, that's perfectly legitimate. You can always do that. There's, you know, there shouldn't be any rules against it. It's a, it's a free choice of whoever decides to be in that group to get together as a group and bargain collectively. That's fine. So, what's going to happen if the employer doesn't meet their demand, uh, or rather, does, doesn't acquiesce to their demand, doesn't raise their salaries? They, they quit as they threaten to do. They stop working. Okay. But what the unions want to do is, after they stop working, they want to stop the employer from being able to hire other people who are not part of the bargaining group who are willing to take the wages that the employer is offering. And if you think about it for, for three seconds, that's the whole point. I mean, there's nothing, again, nothing criminal in my view about people deciding that they want to be paid more and refusing to work unless and until they're paid more. But what the unions do is then forcibly restrict, and by forcibly I mean they use, sometimes they use direct violence, that is not prosecuted by the government or looked upon benignly by the government or they use the government force to enact laws that will enable them to forcibly stop the flow of the supply of other labor, non-unionized labor, to that particular employer 
or to that particular industry, if we're talking about a, an industry-wide union, for example. What would happen in a free market is that if the employer can find other labor that can perform the job satisfactorily at the wage rates that he's willing to offer, but these guys are not willing to accept, then he will just fire these guys, say, okay, fine, you're leaving, nice knowing you, uh, I'm going to go about my business now. He can hire other, other uh, uh, workers to do the work for the wages that he's, he's offering. Okay, If he can't find anybody that is willing to work for, for less than what these guys are demanding, well, he kind of has to pay them what they're demanding. But if he can find other workers who are not part of the strike, are not part of the union, then why on earth should he be stopped by force from hiring them? Again, if you think about the situation from the standpoint of, of those other workers, clearly if they agree to the terms that the employer is offering, clearly they're demonstrating by, by that action that whatever terms the employer is offering are better than all of the alternatives available to them at the time. Other, otherwise, they would not take the offer. Okay, The act of them accepting the offer of the wage rates uh, by that employer demonstrates that they prefer working for those wages for this employer to all of the other alternatives that they currently have. Okay, So what the union wants to do is to stop other workers from coming in and working at the wage rates offered. They're really fighting against other workers. Okay, And in cases where there are they are successful in raising the wage rates, that is at the expense of those other workers who would work for the lower wage. But are now forcibly stopped from doing that. Okay. That's one effect. So you're you're disemploying those people by you know being a union or, or, or enforcing union legislation. You're disemploying the non-unionized labor. That's exactly what you're doing. The other thing that you're doing, a sort of a, a longer run effect, is that um, you're pushing those people out of that industry. They would be working in this industry. You know? Uh, you know, One possible consequence is that this employer is going to be using less labor than he otherwise would because labor has suddenly become more expensive. He will look for other factors to substitute. Um, and he will look for ways to get more productivity or at least the same productivity, pr preferably more productivity, with now you know, less labor because he can't, he can't hire those people. Those, th so the non-unionized labor is going to be pushed out of that particular industry and will have to go and look for employment in other industries or in other regions or both. And that means that the supply of labor in those other regions and other industries is going to go up. And when the supply goes up, with the demand staying where it was, what happens is the price goes down. And the price in that case, the price of labor service for labor services is wages. So wages in other industries and or other regions go down. So the, you know, when they're successful, when unions are successful in raising their wage rates, they're doing that at the expense of other workers in that industry and at the expense of other industries and or other regions. That's what's happening with the unions. It's a simple economic fact that I wanted to point out to you guys. Um, again, the conflict is not with the employer, per se, or not with the employer so much. It's really with the other laborers. And in fact, if you look at the origins of the labor movement, a lot of it has to do with, you know, entrenched white workers not willing to compete against black workers. In later 19th century America, after, especially after the slavery had been abolished, um, a lot of the black uh, workers have entered into the market and were threatening to undercut the entrenched existing position of the white workers. They were willing to work for less. Oh, that's a crime. They're willing to work for less. You know, I'm a, I don't know, I'm a stonemason or I'm a steel worker and I get the salary of X. Well, the, these black guys are coming in and they're willing to work for 70% X of, of X. Well, that can't, we can't have that. No. <laughs> you know, so we're going to disemploy those people. We're going to push them out of this industry or this state or this region and force them to go somewhere else. Uh, flood other labor markets, other industries, whereby the wage rates in those industries are going to be forced to go down, right? 
unless they're successfully pushed out of that other industry as well, and then they have to go to the third industry and so forth. So you get my point. The real origins of um, unionization or union, uh, union movement in America have some connection, some very palpable, very, very real connection with the desire of white workers to exclude cheaper black labor from that market so as not to have to compete against them. That's who they're fighting against. They're fighting against non-unionized labor because non-unionized labor is willing, wants to work for that wage rate that the unions consider to be too low for them. So the unions, unions are going to use the force of the government to make sure that those people who are willing to work for less do not get to work at all. Not in their plant, not in their factory. It's not their factory, but not in the factory where they're working. Not in the industry where they're employed. So yeah, you can you can you can use force to wage your uh, to raise your wage rates at the expense of other people and other industries. That's what union uh, um, union legislation and unionism as such is all about. 